Karish, okay. Got it. Okay, let's start. Let's start, Nirmal uh, Swadesh. Let's let's start. Uh, let me uh, share the presentation. Where is the share part? Firoz, where is the share part? Share screen. Share okay. Screen. Share screen. Okay. Okay. There's a slight difference between Google Meet and Zoom. And more often than not, we are doing a lot on Google Meet. So uh, let me put it as a full screen. Okay. Uh, let me stop the video, my video here, so that we can concentrate on the PPT. Okay, guys. So uh, this unit is about uh, diasporas in India, and this is block one, conceptual framework, and unit seventy-five, pluralism, inclusion, and in exclusion. In fact, it's a very uh, uh, you know interesting thing because as I was preparing this presentation, the first slide that I wanted to show you was this. This is a map of the human migration throughout history. And it actually is a map of Y chromosome and mitochondria DNA. That is how it's been planned. But if we were to take a geographical map of human migration, human beings have been, the modern human, human beings have been on this planet for millions of years. The modern human being came on this planet about, they have traced from about 60,000 to 1 lakh years. In fact, the earlier known theories talked about the modern human being come, uh, you know, evolving in, uh, in East Africa. But now subsequent research is also saying that parallelly, there were uh, humans which evolved in South, the modern humans also evolved in South Africa and other parts of Africa. And inevitably, all human population that we see across the world migrated. So in fact, we can very easily make a substantive claim that the human history is a history of migration. And if people are migrating and settling down and migrating throughout the whatever 60,000 to a lakh years of human history, modern human history is all about migrations. And inevitably, when uh, civilization came about and people developed cultures, and then they moved, they carried their cultures along that culture. When it, uh, you know, interfaced with another culture, there was a culturization. There was mixing of cultures. In fact, diaspora studies have come much later. But uh, you know, if we look at this map. This basically sums up the whole uh, chapter about uh, plurality. And for all people who talk about unique cultures and my culture and your culture, actually human history is all about multicultural. It's all, it's all about uh, plurality, plura plurality. It's about migration. It's about diaspora. So let's uh, take this forward. And because we are doing the Indian, uh, you know, uh, part, let's concentrate on India. Historically, India has been a country which experienced both inward and outward migration. Hence, many communities settled in different stages. So if, if, if one was to pick up, uh, you know, Indian history, how the people came in, from where they came in, there were multiple waves. Uh, you, you know, while, while I was doing my PhD, my PhD was on a community called the Muse. The Muse are settled in a place known as Mewat, which is uh, the, uh, the northern part of the country spanning from Delhi to MP to UP to Rajasthan. And one of the theories that Muse and Jats basically had settled in the 
in in the area called Sindh, which is in the present day Pakistan. And then they they traveled uh, and came and settled in the Indo Indo Gangetic Plain. And if you pick up any uh, community in India, you will see that they have traveled somewhere, they have come from somewhere, they have moved, they have picked up uh, cultures. We have communities from Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Persia, etc. Um, a lot of people do not know, but Parsis are people who came from Persia. Some of them came as traders, some came as soldiers, while others came as refugees. And the same way Indians traveled across the world, some as soldiers, some as uh, you know, indentured laborers, some as slaves. Currently, we are still migrating as uh, technical resources. We are going for jobs. It's all a migration. So what do we do in this unit? In, in this unit, we learn characteristics of a plural society. We understand a little bit about practices of pluralism. We comprehend the contribution of diasporas and we analyze the integration of diasporas in India when we are talking about the plural society. Pluralism is nothing but diversity. These, and the diversity could be cultural, political, religious, ethnic, philosophical, and so forth. Remember when we were talking in the unit on media, I had emphasized something called identity. And as we go about, uh, you know, uh, reading about uh, a plural society, we go about diaspora, diasporic studies, uh, a central tenant of all these comes as identity. And we'll see how this identity comes in. So the diversity could be cultural, political, religious. In fact, no two people have, uh, you know, uh, a everybody works with multiple identities and no two communities are identical. In fact, uh, every time somebody says we need to have a, a similar culture, remember if everybody was wearing the same set of clothes, the same color of shirt and same color of pant for men or the same color of top and bottom for women or a sari for women, how boring or a uh, you know, monochromatic world would be. In fact, all these diversities, what allows uh, you know, those experiences that we gather as we live in this, in this world. And one of the central tenets of plurality is identity. How do I identify myself? And it, uh, there's a very interesting example of this. Uh, and identities, uh, there are multiple identities, identities keep on shifting. How to deal with these identities becomes a very important issue. Whenever we are doing, uh, you know, studies on plurality, on diaspora, how does it work out? So according to Furnival, plural society may be con considered to comprise two or more elements of social order, which live side by side yet without mingling in one political unit. So, for example, in our country, there are multiple religions, multiple languages. Haryana is one of a smaller Indian states. So you can go from one uh, end of Haryana to another end of Haryana in five hours. And yet, if you travel in Haryana, Every few kilometers, you will see a change of dialect. You will see a change of food habits. You will see a change of clothing. There are so many changes that you will see in such a small state. And if you go on to larger states like UP, MP, the, the changes that you incorporate is phenomenal. Crowley remarked that pluralism becomes possible in society through plural acculturations. Remember, we constantly mix with each other. 
human being is a social animal societies intermingle they intermingle because of migration they intermingle because of marriages they intermingle because of so many factors and when they intermingle so for example look at a basic case of marriage when a, a girl from a different family or a different cult uh, which has a different culture in spite of having a same religion or a same language or a same region will have changes in culture gets married and comes to a boy's house or they set up a separate uh, you know micro unit there is an a culturalization happening each speaking out of a different culture and getting uh, you know influenced and affected by it so uh, areas of language folk belief magic practice meeting family structures festivals music paves the way for framing of a common ground for social unity and we also realize the fact that there are multiple cultures and the only uh, you know way a social unity can uh, come across is through a common ground if you see what's happening in manipur there are uh, you know there it is happening because of misunderstanding miscommunication clash of cultures there is a whole lot of politics which is being involved till the time we we are able to understand Uh, and get a common ground there is unity as soon as there is we 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 don't have a common ground there will always be a clash in plural uh, a culturalization persons with each ethnic category retain their raw identity yet we are familiar with the cultural activities of other groups look at uh, how we stay in urban areas or in rural areas uh, with our neighbors our neighbors come from different culture they might be coming from different uh, you know religion they could be coming from uh, different areas of the country and we and unless we are able to respect each other we do understand that my neighbor will be slightly different from me mutual understanding between these groups thus prevent from society from fragmenting because if we are not able to understand each other's culture they will always be fragmenting and a point of dissolution so uh, that's how the society works uh, there there has to be an understanding and that is why uh, you know cultural studies uh, are a part of the education curriculum uh, we are we are we we read about various these foods we read about various dressing habits to be able to appreciate each other in a plural society undue dominance of one culture over another is the norm because the minute there is a dominance of one culture over the other there typically rises some amount of friction in fact multicultural education is the way for people to understand cultural differences appreciate cultural differences and based on the premise that conflict can be resolved with peace and harmony because inevitably when we talk about a uh, progress of human beings we talk about progress of civilization or we talk about human civilization the reason humans were able to uh, civilize themselves and live in larger society is because they were able to understand plural cultures they were able to understand multicultures and if we were to look at india the indian constitution and the indian political parties are two uh, ways by which uh, pluralism is promoted in the country for example the constitution provisions play a crucial role uh, varied differences and diverse uh, voices uh, secular fabric of the constitution essential and integration of various sections 
we have realized again through the history of the country, when we read the history of the country and we see how the country has evolved, multiculturalism and a plural culture and the constitution helps and that is what keeps the society cemented. Whenever we've, we've gone about not being able to appreciate each other's cultures, there's always been friction and fragmentation. Besides the constitution, political parties accommodate diverse interests, provide voice and representations to various plural identities. In fact, the Manipur uh, problem right now is again because somewhere down the line, the, the communication between diverse interests and different cultures have not been negotiated and it has led to violence. And this is something which happens across the world. So uh, if you were to look at pluralism in India, historical accounts, India has always been a plural uh, society, accommodates group identities, affirming national unity and increasing. Whenever the country accommodates group identities, it increases administrative efficiency. For example, each schedule of Indian constitution, 22 languages have been recognized as official. Which basically the constitution allows or points towards or enables multiculturalism. Because they understand the constitutional framers understood the fact that India was a plural society and enabled various identities to play out. And the political party and the politics gives voice to all these identities. In fact, the plural aspects of Indian society has helped strengthen secular, liberal and democratic ethos. Democracy is where everybody feels a part of the larger unit. Diasporas very clearly promote a plural society because diasporas are people who have come from a different culture and have settled into a, you know, a host country which has a different culture. India being a destination country is from people across the globe. Di diasporas have helped establish a multicultural society, influences through process in the host society. Whenever a diaspora, diaspora happens and a diasporic community influences the host society which helps develop a deeper understanding of the diverse experience of the world. For example, Parsis. Parsis came from Iran. When, uh, when the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire was, uh, you know, attacked by the Arabs, uh, the, the, the Zoroastrians from Iran uh, traveled in waves to India. They are the Parsi community. They have an absolute, Parsis have a very interesting uh, uh, culture in terms of their promotion. There is something called a fire temple. So a very interesting uh, cultural pattern. For example, they don't cremate their dead. In the fire temple, initially what typically used to happen is the, 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 the dead body was kept for the vultures to feed upon because their culture, you know, said, why waste uh, organic matter? It was, it was a different matter that when the vultures became extinct, Parsis were perforce, uh, you know, uh, forced to cremate their dead. Now, uh, you know, when, whenever we come across a different culture, unless we are sensitive to the other culture, we might find the other culture strange. But that's what cultural studies do to be able to understand that each society has its own unique culture and all of us make up the world. So let's take the case study of uh, two communities uh, or what they say, Habshi slash Siddhis. Af these are the Africans in India. Africans in India have been called by multiple names. In fact, it's surprising that even today, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, street side language called Africans by the name Hapshis. Hapshis have multiple connotations, but uh, Hapshi is a word I still hear people talk about when they uh, have to talk about the African community. 
1935, after 1935, they have been categorized as Negroids and proto-Australites in academic domain. And the interesting part of uh, these is that the first wave of migration took place of Africa. So if we go back to the migration map, almost all human beings have come out of Africa because the evolution of human beings happened in Africa. Ancestors of Negroid supply arrived and their progenitors may include Andaminis, Kadars, Kanikars, Panyas, Pulian, Uralis, living in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka. <coughs> so uh, the first wave of migration happened uh, more than 60,000 years ago. Proto-Australites were assumed to have arrived in the second wave around 50,000 years ago. And here, this is where, you know, uh, when, I, when, when I tell my, when I talk to my students, I said, let's take it in perspective. An average human being is 72 years or 80 years. We have been on this planet for tens of thousands of years. The racial group can be traced in India, central and southern region. Members of both groups became primarily tribal people becoming a permanent part of the Indian population. So if if uh, we start having this discourse that who were the original Indians, then possibly the tribals will have the first uh, stake in being the original Indians. But the interesting part is what is original and wh who migrated is very difficult to categorize. Then it comes into the realm of politics. For example, Siddhis were brought from Africa to the Indian subcontinent as slaves in the last 500 years. The term Siddhi is derived from Siddh or Saidi. There are two interpretations. One was to bestow honor to uh, the African Muslims holding high positions and the other was implying captive or prisoner of war in uh, Arabic language. So, there is a, there are these Siddhis and uh, let's look at this. This was very interesting. It has been, Siddhis have become naturalized in the Indian way. Was The term Siddhi was introduced by British in the 19th century. Afri there are Africans in Gujarat and Karnat known as Siddhi, whereas Africans in Andhra Pradesh identify themselves with Yemeni Muslims and call themselves Chosh and sometimes as Siddhi because of multiple identities. Remember, Identity becomes a very important part and all of us, including communities, have multiple identities. And humans as well as communities shift identities based on various uh, you know, parameters. For example, if I was uh, taking as, a, as me as a person, uh, my identity could be as a father, my identity could be as a husband, my identity could, uh, could be as a son. My identity could be based on my religion, based on my language, based on my state of origin, multiple identities. In fact, there was a Hapshi dynasty which ruled Bengal for six years in 1486. Which after being expelled from Bengal, uh, sought refuge in Delhi and then migrated south. They worked as concubines, domestic servants, was appointed at Salakas. This is very interesting. An article in Indian Express about the African rulers, the Hapshi dynasty. And if you Google, you will come across enough articles on the Hapshi dynasty. And obviously, if they were rulers for six years, they would have influenced the culture out there. And as they moved, they would have influenced cultures. Highest estimation is about 55,000 after partition. A lot of Siddhis found themselves in territories belonging to Pakistan, live in small provincial com communities, Predominantly poor and uneducated, mostly Muslims, but also Christians and Hindus. 
still remain isolated and economically and socially neglected. Recently, they have been registered as ST. But again, you know, they, they are the tribal, they are categorized as tribal, they are all scattered across, and they have multiple religions. So this inclusion and exclusion de debate also, uh, you know, there is a lot of debate happening, not only in India, but across the world. Uh, and this debate is also happening in the realm of patriotism, nationalism. And simultaneously, there is a process known as internationalism. The strangest part is as internet uh, uh, is, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, people and nations to be connected more closely, uh, nations across, uh, are, uh, you know, and politics across is, is going into, uh, you know, a nationalism part or a national state part. Then there is this element of patriotism. One of the theories is that nationalism has primarily led to the development of negative emotions and attitudes towards immigration, immigration and immigrants, and, which is ironical because history of human beings is about migrations. And the only way to offset is uh, through something called internationalism, which develops a positive role towards immigrants and immigration processes. So uh, 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 a study says national attachment does not create negative attitudes. However, national attachment takes the form of nationalism. It goes into developing a negative attitude. And obviously there is uh, an element of politics in, which comes into the picture and how negotiation happens between the immigrants and the host country. So there is a lot of this inclusion and exclusion debate which is happening. Think about the fact that America, which was supposed to be a country for, uh, for immigrants, where immigrants throughout history have come in, is now talking of building a wall to keep out immigrants. So it's a very interesting way human societies move. So one of the crucial ways to understand inclusion and exclusion in a country's polity is to measure the extent which voices are listened to in a public policy process. After all, every the, the, the theory says that immigrants uh, you know, uh, induce plurality, diversity, diversity is always good for a society. Think about the fact the normal procreation in human beings or living things become better with diversity. Basic norms of human procreation says that you should not procreate within the same family or same, uh, you know, uh, you know, from the same ancestor because that reduces, uh, you know, brings in your defective genes. So the more diversity of procreation, the better the offspring comes about. It's a basic biology and the basic science. Similarly, with diversity, your, uh, your understanding, uh, you know, the plurality and the richness of life becomes better. So one crucial way of inclusion exclusion is to measure what extent voices are being listened and eligibility projects for specific assistance and programs. So for example, there's one more substantive way of comprehending inclusion of citizens, uh, which is that besides government agencies, response of NGOs, religious organization, philanthropic organization, deeper insights into understanding of inclusion, exclusion in real sense. And we have also seen that when, uh, in case of diasporas, when the host country includes diasporas, there is a sense of well-being. There is always a sense of addition. There's always a sense of well-being. There is more, much better integration and much more harmony.
It has been witnessed that host states often deny refugees basic rights. They're abdicating the responsibility towards international organization. Lack of citizenship in host states render refugees incapacitated incapac to speak for political rights and the right to be heard. Irrespective, see, that's where the debate is that irrespective of the fact that a person might be an immigrant, might be a refugee, does that deny that person from basic human rights? Now, this is a question which nations, uh, nation states and policymakers have to answer. Just because a person is a refugee, does he or she be deprived of basic human rights? Because if we start doing that, then how do we distinguish ourselves between human beings and animals? In fact, animals protect their uh, you know, area. Uh, they are ready to do all kinds of things to protect their area. Does human being also do the same? And if they do the same, then what does civilization mean for us? In fact, the conventional notion of citizen is being challenged by refugees to claim political space. People with multiple split citizenship and split life has challenged the traditional dimension associated with sin. In fact, today, after COVID, there is a new norm which is called digital nomads, where countries are offering foreigners to come and settle down and work there. So there is this, uh, this, this negotiation going on between countries trying to close their borders and countries trying to uh, you know, get people to come in. Because remember, whenever people come in, they will not only provide income, they would provide diversity. They would uh, you know, uh, look at every person benefits. See, irrespective of the fact that a person might be refugee, the refugee will also contribute to the economic progress of a country and influence the culture. So, for example, if you look at our own Indian cuisine, our Indian cuisine has been tremendously affected by various people who came to the country. They brought in their vegetables, they brought in their fruits, uh, spices came in, things came in, our, uh, uh, our cuisine is uh, influenced by uh, multiple uh, people, multiple immigrants who came in. So newer and more inclusive definitions of citizens are being conceptualized. S displaced people are attempting to self-realize rights or looking beyond the host state as the sole duty bearer, creating lived multiple and multi-layered citizenship experiences. So there is this multiple uh, negotiations which are happening. Okay, let's look at, so the concept of global citizen, again, in, in, a, in a world where internet is a global resource, trying to get world together and getting cultures to influence each other using internet, why the global citizenship becomes a natural extension. And in fact, in 1922, the Nansen passport by the League of Nations came in. The first refugee travel document, these passports are today recognized as the greatest achievement of League of Nations. 52 countries were honoring them by 1942. There is something called a World Service Authority, a non-profit organization that promotes world citizenship. We're still not looking at the fact that, you know, uh, technology is getting us together and yet there is this thing about uh, nationalism, nation states. After doing a research study on six countries, Diana Sainsbury uh, uh, concluded that finally five analytical co components determine the extension of right by countries, thereby indicating the politics of inclusion and exclusion for immigrants. So what are these five analytical components? First, issue framing. How are the issues being framed? If immigrant policies are formulated uh, to promote social or economic integration of the immigrants, then Ministry of Social Affairs come in or the Ministry of Labor will come in. And if the immigrants' cultural integration is the government's objective, then the main policy venue could be Ministry of Culture. 
a whole lot of governments are looking at immigrants in 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 terms of national security and that is why ministry of home affairs comes in so who how are you framing the issue will determine uh, which ministry comes across second component institutional arrangement policy venues and policy coalitions policy venues may be defined as institutional locations where authoritative decisions are made concerning a given issue first is it an issue where are decision made about an issue so for example crucial features like insul insulation from public view and pressures are facilitated bureaucratic and judicial venues to grant rights to immigration while legislative is not able to because legislative is all about negotiation and then it goes in a larger framework do we take this immigrants what is our policy what is any nation's policy towards immigrants refugees or the likes how do we perceive them third component territorial dimensions the third component is itself divided into two parts first the distribution of power responsibilities uh, uh, between the levels of government and its relationship to social and immigration policies so is it a is it is it a set is it a unitary government or is it a federal government where are the decisions being taken so uh, how is the country viewing it how is the country viewing the immigration process where is the decision taking place where, where is the venue of decision taking and then the territorial dimension pattern of and how is the settlement happening decision making at local levels or under decentralized units often go against the social rights and welfare of immigrants and minorities because for a simple reason the local units look at very very uh, narrow politics so that is why how this this components fit in fourth component political parties becomes a very important component because political party play a significant role in framing of issues is the political party looking at what is the larger viewpoint of the political party because the political party's objective is to win election and maximum votes can it become a crucial source for bringing policy change and that is why uh, very important for leaders to look at the larger picture and because political parties go on to form the government they play a significant role in formation of politics of policies how are the policies make do you look at international covenants do you look at international rules uh, what the, what does your country represent is all determined by the political parties if there is a partisan composition of government degree of fragmentation of the party state system then the policies will be different for a, a one view suggests that the center right parties usually take restrictive positions on immigration which we have seen across the world and integration continue the traditional stance on issues like national security law and order and low tax so based on research they have come up with these and not not to uh, forget the fifth component being the nature of immigration organization organizing and penetration of policy uh, process much emphasis on discourse that immigrants are minorities and they lack political rights with few resources in comparison to majority population so a larger uh, you know uh, discourse is this so uh, the research says such discourse limits our understanding just to focus on ethnic mobilization and claim perspectives whereas need to understand the politics of pressure presence so that the actors in represented politics how are, are these immigrants 
appear in public places uh, uh, having a voice so for example today a lot of us technology companies are uh, uh, are headed by indians the politics of presence is phenomenal in addition to the focus on elected positions there is a need to emphasize towards appointed post is the host country appointing some immigrants into into policy making into giving feedback that also is a possible is a way of inclusion government inquiry commissions various positions in the central and state administrations examining the penetration of immigrants in policy processes potential impact of policies after the partition or so inevitably unless we have this five components we look at the five components as a state policy or you know which includes political parties which includes institutions we we will not be able to understand the inclusion and exclusion so whenever we say that oh we are including immigrants or we are including refugees how are we doing that in fact Uh, whenever the discourse happens on, uh, let's say even SCSTs, we talk about inclusion and exclusion. Are SCSTs given a role in policy making in, uh, you know, in uh, in various government, uh, you know, committees? Becomes a very important part of the inclusion and exclusion. Okay, let's sum up. we we conceptualized the idea of a plural society we understood the practical the uh, pra, uh, practicing dimensions associated with pluralism in india the diasporic role in promoting a plural society is hapshi siddhis parsis armenians as i said uh, a, a, a jats came in from central asia contemporary dimensions relating to their identity with specific respect to inclusion and exclusion and debates about inclusion and exclusion and there are some references there is a tibetan diaspora framework geographical compass we have the context of diaspora citizens somali communities in finland and the united states citizenship and identity uncanniness of late modernity unintended consequences of indian policy on citizens for tibetan refugees once you get the unit this is all a part of the unit there are some other references and suggested readings ps ghosh migrants refugees and stateless in south asia gm hess immigrant ambassadors belonging and transnational refugees tibetan rehabilitation policy okay any questions let me stop sharing and let me bring in my video nirmal swadesh any questions yeah no questions uh, right now okay regard the whole idea okay wonderful nice conversation oh good to see you good to see you sudesh <laughs> fi fi finally yeah. get to see you lot of experience and you are work very such oriented things uh, uh, highly motivated myself <laughs> very good very good yeah, very sir. good thank you sir thankfully what technology that we are able to see each other from uh, long distances yeah. though uh, two and two and a half years of covid really got me sick on to online mode i die to be in a classroom now yes yeah, sir you pointed out most uh, things it will touches my heart okay. today yeah, absolutely <laughs> many political parties they ignored the welfare of uh, migrant workers even Uh, even yeah, American NRA is coming to India, and they are contesting in uh, MP elections. Uh, uh. These Gulf migrants are they could not get uh, even uh, tickets and reforms from that uh, political parties. 
because of their seeing looking this migration uh, as a blue collar workers and that uh, us uk europe migration is a classic and a class migration class work uh, people uh, white collar jobs they are moving this kind of discrimination going on that's why we are uh, demanding many demands going with uh, state and central government they are not uh, coming forward to fulfill their uh, aspirations as of now coming assembly election 2023 in telangana ah. we using with village diaspora organizations okay every from one village they coming to forward and the file nomination okay okay yeah. we are uh, looking that okay kind of wonderful we uh, looking uh, grab the attention of these uh, political parties correct very important because it's it's a, it's a, it's a, again as i said the lens that uh, you know large political parties across the world have started looking at from the lens from law and order security inevitably that's a very parochial lens and yeah. once we or what about that nri voting that also ha huh. <laughs> taxi voting and nri voting online voting ha huh. Huh. So now, uh, implementing this, many migrants are looking, but uh, the government of India not coming forward to give uh, this uh, mm. online voting. Okay. 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 Great. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful to uh, see your face, Swadesh, and uh, hope to continue engaging with you. Nirmal, any question? no sir okay wonderful theek hai so uh, firoz i think we can close it's already 4 o'clock so thank you sir thank you for such a wonderful uh, lecture and for such a wonderful way you have explained each and everything again you i mean to say we really like the way you are teaching and every time you are discussing with the things thank you sir thank you thank you very much bye bye then have a nice weekend bye bye thank- Bye bye keep in touch with Philos bye okay sir thank you